do since it is 201, an official, um, an official welcome to everyone to this webinar. We're going to be talking about the long-term effects of COVID on behavioral health. And this is really, we have a project funded by AFG. I'm Sarah Jenke. I'm the director of the Center for Fire Rescue and EMS Health Research. And one of our studies is on COVID and the long-term impact for the fire service. We're going to do some interviews. We're going to do some, um, some both qualitative and some quantitative work on this. But part of it is developing the stakeholder panel where we've been going back to our folks um, in, in some key positions and saying like, what are you seeing? What information needs to get out there? And one thing, it actually came from Frankie, said, you know, just the long-term effects of this. And it is, I put on Twitter, like that the, um, I wanted to title this like, will this ever fucking end? And I didn't think it was appropriate. So I didn't, although I did get some feedback on Twitter that they actually liked that as a title. So I might have to, it, some people are all like, oh, you can't put that on my, on a lister. Well, I guess if you make your own lister, you can put whatever you want. I know. See, you can't go much lower than that. Um, but I, so we pulled together a, a group and Frank said, he'd be happy to come on, but he, we were, he started to talk and he said, you know, we need a variety. So like, here's your variety of a lot of the folks that I go to um, in the fire service when I have questions on behavioral health, I, um, I would, I, I, I'd like everyone to just introduce themselves briefly because I think you do a better job of it than I do. But let me say that I'm honored that you guys all were willing to um, jump on this call because I, I mean, like we have a beautiful bi-coastal um, group here. And really like I've had conversations with each of you about, it's true, John, it's bi-coastal and then Texas and Kansas City, we're all over the place. Um, but, but seriously, folks that I really like respect and, and some I've known for quite a while and some I'm relatively new to, but I'm already just like, I'm in, I'm in, these are awesome folks. So, um, Frank, since I already said your name, do you want to go first? Sure. And, uh, thank you so much for having me. And then the team at NDRI, a great team, Brittany, Hannah, and of course you, Sarah, um, I'm Frank Lido and I work with the counseling unit at FDMY. All right, uh, John, since you mocked me, you can go second. It, it, it wasn't mocking. I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing at <laughs> you. There's a difference. Um, my name is John Oates. I'm the chief of department in East Hartford Fire Department in East Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, everything I know about behavioral health, Frank taught me. Um, me too. So uh, I'm, I'm honored to, to be asked to participate in this in this. Uh, discussion today about what the impacts that that we've seen and and continue to see as as the pandemic rolls on. So, Sarah, thank you for the the invitation, and I'm I'm encouraged by the the, the conversation. Yeah, awesome, Mark Cruz. You're next on my list. Hey, um, thank you uh, for inviting me, Sarah, and it's great to be a part of this group. My name is Mark Cruz. I'm the staff psychologist for Austin Fire Department, Austin Travis County EMS, where I've been for. Uh, getting close to 10 years now. Uh, before that, I was at the VA uh, for five years working with returning war veterans. And then in addition to this work, I do consultation with some uh, some departments outside of outside of my primary role here. So happy nice. to be here. Fantastic. Scott, our other coach. Hi. Um, hello, everybody. I'm, again, it's an honor to be on and thank you for doing this. I think it's an extremely important uh, my name is Scott Ross. I'm the peer support coordinator for LA County Fire. Uh, we have 3,200 members with our department. We've got a big department, uh, 3,200 members across a very large geographical area. Uh, brings a daily uh, excitement to it all. Uh, a lot of stuff happening. Um, I also am an instructor with the IFF, work with Frank quite a bit. Um, just really happy to be here and hopefully I have some insight to what's happening out here in California. Awesome. And I will not um, make Hannah introduce herself, but she is our master of ceremonies. And Brittany, you want to bring up the rear in a nice, we love and adore you way? <laughs> I don't know. Introduce yourself, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is Brittany Hollerbeck. I'm a postdoctoral researcher on the team with Sarah. Uh, I definitely want to give a big shout out to Hannah. She has organized this whole thing and put this together so that we can all be here today. Uh, it's a super important topic, and I am so happy to just sit and listen to the great minds that are in this virtual room. So, Awesome. All right. Well, um, I have some questions. Feel free to everyone that's on the webinar to type questions in, and we had a couple that were emailed in, so thanks for that. 
My first is just kind of broad. Like, what are you seeing with the departments and with the folks that you're working with um, in the departments in terms of behavioral health? Like, what does this look like across and what does it look like now? Well, I can um, talk about 3,200 members who uh, have been put to the test in this last year. Um, from all those things that we've, we've talked about and we know what we've gone through in this last year, we kind of refer to it as uh, 2020 as our dumpster fire, right? Um, really want that one to go away. But not only the pandemic, all of our folks that were going in and responding um, daily, the call volumes that were excessive, uh, 25, 30 calls a day in a 24 hour period, of uh, going out and seeing these folks and putting themselves in harm's way, something we have never really experienced. I, I, I recall a comment from a guy that had been on for 32 years, and he goes, you know, I've never, ever been on, worried about the alarm. Uh, I trust my training, but this is something very new. And I actually think about it every time that alarm goes off. Is this the call that's going to get me sick? Uh, staffing issues recalls because we had so many people out with uh that had gotten sick or were in that ring tracing exposed it definitely put an impact on our staffing and then we threw in wildland fires that you know really exhausted our resources it got to be a point where we had affecting families so much because folks were never home uh and it goes on and on i mean i could sit here and tell you all the things that impacted our first responders, uh, and at this point, they they just need to catch their breath. We need a break. Yeah, I can echo uh, what what Scott was just talking about here with our folks. Um, and actually, I think it was John who brought it up in one of the emails that we had a huge weather incident um, uh, right after Valentine's Day that, that seemed to just kind of push us over the edge. But we saw this interesting transition when this first started going. Uh, Texas was not one of the areas that was hardest hit in the beginning. So we had a little bit of, of, of kind of a warm up period to watch what our, what our friends in New York were dealing with um, to kind of get up and ready. And, and initially we saw um, a lot of anxiety, but we saw a lot of people coming together. And uh, our, our, uh, our sick calls went way out, went way down. Uh, people were showing up for shift. Um, our EMS crews, uh, everyone was showing up, doing everything they could. And there was a lot of support in the community and appreciation in the community um, for our first responders. And then during the summertime, um, following uh, what happened in Minneapolis, uh, we saw a big shift uh, in terms of things uh, that were going on. Um, and so uh, some of our first responders had talked about going in a matter of a week, going from, you know, being thanked and praised every time they went anywhere and getting offered free meals to all of a sudden feeling very different about, um, about the way they were being appreciated. And we kind of rode through that and got used to that. And then things kind of got worse for us in the fall. Um, and then things started to get a little bit better once the vaccines rolled out. And then we had, we had Snowmageddon. And in Texas, we cannot handle that. I think you all saw that in the news. Um, and so as a state, we were, we were really unprepared for that. Um, but I think one of the things that's, that's been dramatic com components, uh, compared to regular bad calls, where you go to work, you deal with the bad call, and you come back to the station and it's over, um, it hasn't been over uh, for any of our folks. And it's not over when they go home because their families are dealing with the COVID response. Uh, their kids have now been away from school, some of them for long periods of time. Um, and so they're starting to have issues uh, with, with the social isolation. And so it's affected not just our individuals and, and how fatigued they are um, and the work that they're actually doing, but it's affected our families. And so we're seeing just a lot of stuff um, related to how families are getting together. Uh, everybody needs a nice long vacation uh, when this is all done. Yeah, I, I agree, Mark. And um, we, we've seen it here in, in kind of waves, um, you know, and, I, and none of us knew really what to expect. Uh, I mean, the first wave was just the anxiety of becoming infected. You know, so that was the first wave where, as we were seeing, um, you know, the victims in the street. And so it was the, the anxiety being infected. And then the next wave was the anxiety of infecting others. So 
uh, we've never, you know, we've always done our job and knew the risk, but we never thought we would take those risks home to our family. Uh, so then, you know, then there was the quarantine wave, the grief wave, the family issue wave, the financial financial stress wave, uh, the alcohol exacerbation wave, uh, and and now the emotional exhaustion uh, wave. I think people are just really, really tired, and, and we're starting to see that in a lot of family problems uh, with kids, with spouses. Uh, it's really become kind of like an, almost an epidemic of, of, you know, family stress. And I, and I think, you know, we being on the, the, the East coast, we were, were benefited a little bit that, you know, we started watching very early on when, when King County, Washington started having their issues and we watched them walk across the country and then having FDNY and, and, and some of the places in, in Westchester County, New Rochelle, that was a, an early center that we, we mined that information really, really quick and talked to smart people and say, look, what if, if you were going to do it over again in the first few months, what would you change? And then, and try to implement that really, really quickly to make sure that, that we were a little bit more prepared rather than just waiting for stuff to happen. Um, somehow we got fortunate that we went, we went all the way to, to the week before Thanksgiving, before we had a single member test positive. But then once it started, it was like, it was game on. We went from thanks from Thanksgiving to Valentine's day was, was ugly for us, you know, from a, from a staffing perspective and a quarantine perspective. And, and, and so you, you put all those things together, plus the pace, plus the acuity, plus the activity. And, and oh, by the way, because of everything else that's going on, we took away from everybody virtually every way that they could, every tool that they could use to manage stress. You couldn't go to a sporting event. You couldn't go to a bar. You couldn't go hang out with your friends. Um, you couldn't go to church. Um, you couldn't go to the park, you know, all the things that people would normally do to, to manage the stress. We took all those things away. So, you know, that, that led to a problem too. And, and similar to, you know, Frank Scott, everybody is, I, th I think it, now we're seeing that people are just like, I'm, I'm, I'm done, you know, I'm, and not done. Like I'm going to walk away. Although we had some of that happen too. Um, but just like, I, you know, I, I want it to be over. I want, I want normal back. And, and even though nobody can describe really what, what normal is going to look like. And what are you seeing? Because there's um, a, a couple of things came up about like sh changes in um, calls and changes in like what families are struggling with. Are you seeing changes with firefighters first in like what you perceive as substance use and abuse or like domestic violence calls, child abuse calls? I know it sounds like, and that's part of the question we are going to answer with some of the data that um, Lori Moore Merrill has, but is there a shift in calls they're responding to and are you seeing a shift in, in the firefighters, like how they're handling it? One of the, one of the things that, that became evident was because everybody, every media, every news story, every blurb was, was in what rough shape the hospitals were in. You would, you've quickly found the people that, that would, an elderly person that probably would have gotten placed in a, in a care facility was still at home. The person that was having mild chest pain and I didn't feel good didn't call 911 because they didn't want to go to the hospital. So the and we we provide ALS. So the the patients that we were seeing were sicker because they waited longer because they didn't want to go to the hospital because all they heard was that the hospital is a terrible place to be. And I I mean I I get it. The hospital is no place for a sick person. But I mean it's it's still it would we saw a higher acuity of we saw less patients but a higher acuity of patients because they were all a, a mess by the time we got to them. And, and again, it's just, we're busy ish already. So it wasn't, it wasn't the volume, but it was the, the criticality. And I think now, because it's, because it's gone on so long, it's just that, that we have created in a microcosm, this wear and tear stress injury over, uh, you know, rather than a career, we created a wear and tear stress injury over a year um, that it's just, it is, it is, you know, five grit sandpaper on everybody's life every single day. And, you start to see the domestic violence piece. Absolutely. We see that in the community. Um, kids acting out the behavioral issue calls either in the schools or in, in homes that we've responded to absolutely off the chart. Um, and then you put the, the shifts in policing that go on top of that, that, you know, they, it, it's just, it's created that level of complication um, that it's, you're, you're, it's, it's a juggling act, you know, beyond what we normally experience. 
Th there's one, you know, one real positive um, thing that I've seen is, is the firehouse or the fire station, which is an incredibly healing place uh, where everybody else in the world was isolated and isolating. Uh, the firehouse is still a place in, in New York City where 12 men and women come together um, and uh, they still have that camaraderie. They still have that sense of purpose. So I, I always think about if we didn't have that, what our population would look like. Uh, it, you know, it's you know, it's it's something that no psychologist can do, no therapist can do, no yoga studio can do. Uh, what what we have in the fire service, uh, and you know, with the strain that this department and many departments around the country uh, have been under for the past year. Uh, with the grief, the, the trauma that, that they've seen in, in the streets and in their own families. Uh, we do have this wonderful place we call the firehouse. I would agree that, that some of the positive stuff for sure, and I mentioned it earlier about uh, the Zoom meetings. I mean, I think we're all Zoomed out. Um, we really truly want to get back to live in-person training uh, that social gatherings, if you will, but it has really helped. Uh, I, I'm not a techie guy. I am now a Zoom master. I didn't ever think I would be. Uh, team, go to teams, team meeting, all these different things that we do, but it has really helped connect some people that were lost in this isolation to at least have a visual. Family meetings were done. We had a weekly um, you know, with our extended family, our cousins and all that stuff from around the country. And we would do that on a weekly thing. We even put together um, through our instructors group, uh, Jeff Gothier out of Milwaukee had put a, um, and it wasn't any, we didn't talk business. It was just, how are you doing? Just to make sure we're doing okay. But, and then again, the retirees that I had mentioned, we did something up North and put that together. And of course it was a struggle for those that were technically, you know, disadvantaged and granddaughters, thank God for all the younger folks that helped the elderly, you know, get on the Zoom meetings. But what I saw in that is that once we got through that technological struggle, that connection of folks was super impactful. I mean, it became emotional. Um, and that's the positive stuff is that we do still have a way to do that connection. Um, you know, we might be over Zoom and, and, and we can feel it. Um, we want to get back together, but uh, at least we had that. Good point. We were talking a little bit earlier before we officially got this turned on, but, but social distancing versus social isolation has been something that, that we keep talking about in our department, our agencies and with our folks and, and how to respect, you know, the, the real legitimate risk that, that this, you know, virus is. Um, with not becoming super isolated. And, you know, I think in the beginning, all of us kind of benefited from these uh, Zoom happy hours. Um, I know that, uh, I know several people in, in these groups participated in some of those initially, and it was kind of, you know, fun and interesting in the beginning and, and, and how to kind of keep this social connection uh, going um, until we get to a place where it is safe for everybody to be physically back together again. Oh, uh, what went, because we've talked about all the challenges that you've seen, but what would you say your department did right, or that you've heard that other departments have done right, that have helped, helped people manage the stress? Because this is like, I mean, uh, and a couple um, comments have been made too about, you know, that it's, it wasn't just COVID. It was an entire dumpster fire of COVID on top of civil unrest, on top of like, just all sorts of things. So what is, what's your department done well that has kept people kind of sane or as sane as 2020 allows? For, for FDMY, I mean, I thought they did a wonderful job of disseminating information. And, you know, we hadn't always done that well in the past. And, and information, and I've said this before, is, is healing as well. So just knowing that we were changing protocols daily as we got more information or the science became available. And instead of just changing the protocol, there was, you know, there was an explanation of why the protocol was changed. And that came out daily. And the information 
was not only disseminated by the department, but by other unions. So the unions would send it to your personal email, which made you let you know that the unions were also on board. So that was, I, I thought that was really great. It gave you information like how many people were sick, how many people tested positive, how many people had died um, in, within the department. And you know, it was tough information to take, but you knew the change every day. So I, I thought they had learned from the past and really got on top of information. Yeah, I, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with Frank. The information coming out um, within our department, and and we're a big department out here on the West Coast, but um, we kind of, you know, I, I took it another step further, right? Even within our own department, um, and we have a lot of smaller departments and around in and around the Southern California area. Um, so in that uh, kind of information sharing and networking. Uh, we built um, a uh, Southern California peer support coordinators, and I started it with just a few departments as we expanded out. It grew and grew, and from San Luis Obispo all the way to San Diego, the peer support coordinators for the departments started sharing what's working well for you. What, are you, what is your department doing? What, you know, and then we kind of got a gauge of where everyone was. How, how many people do you have off? And, and we learned so much. And just the networking, I had, you know, peer support coordinator from San Diego talking to Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara to, you know, Glendale and Ventura County. That information sharing was utilized amongst all departments. So we became kind of this whole bigger group of information sharing. And it really seemed to work really well. And I think, I think, you know, a couple pieces to stack on top of that is leveraging technology to, to not just communicate with, with our members, but communicate with the families. I mean, there was more than one occasion where, you know, the, the letter that went out to the department was followed by a similar memo that, that went to the families and got posted on the department's Facebook and said, hey, look, this is what we're doing it's to take care of your member to make sure that, you know, the family understands that, that we're not just we're not just kind of going through this where we're putting some intentional thought in it. And that was part of it too, is, is we tried, we tried really, really hard to be ahead of the curve. So we were never in a place where we were going to have to react that if something was happening either on the left coast or in, in the city that we're like, all right, well, it's coming. So we need to be ready for it. So when it, it popped up, it's like, boom, here's the policy, here's the directive, here's the change, here's what we're doing. And, and a lot of that just goes back to, to, to something that, that Frank said, we talked about is how about, let's just be decent human beings. Let's, let's take care of the public that we're serving. Let's take care of the people that, that are working for us and do it in a very legitimate way. And, and one of the ways that we did that, and it, I don't know if I would do it again because it was a gigantic pile of work, is we connected every, so every patient that COVID pre-screened through 911 that then attached to that person with a positive test or a negative test was then attached back to the crew that responded to the call. So we have this gigantic data set that connected. If there's somebody in our community that tested positive that we responded to, we know exactly who, where, and what crew did, and then be able to provide the notification to those people go, hey, look, just so you know, the person that lives at the corner of walk and don't walk that you responded to last Tuesday tested positive, you know, do your general incident report, did you wear your PPE, blah, 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 are the things we need to know about. And then that evolved into how we did contact tracing as, as, as things, you know, we were doing sort of a form of contact tracing from the beginning. So it made it easier once we got to the point where we had to do that. And it ended up with this, I mean, it, a huge pile of data and a lot of work to do it. But I think it, it demonstrated to the membership that, look, we're, we're serious about this and we're not going to let you fall through a clack, crack or fall into a hole where, you know, you rubbed up against something icky and we don't know about it and we don't care about it. That's great, John. And like our guys and gals would walk to, you know, do patient care like they were walking into a nuclear reactor yeah. and they get back to the firehouse and be hugging each other with no mask on. <laughs> yep. So, I mean, that, that's, I mean, the, most of the contagion happened among themselves. When they were public facing, they were with their PPEs. That wasn't happening there. It was happening back at the firehouse. And, and that's exactly, oddly, that's exactly what we found. We had we have 
even to, to now, you know, 14, 13 months into this, in, into this train wreck, we have, we don't have a positive COVID test among a member that we can attach back to a call for service. Everything is exactly like Frank said, everything is tied back to uh, a family member, a kid, an outside, you know, interaction or, you know, whatever they, they, they picked it up from, from a, a park bench or whatever they were doing outside of here. They, we can't, you're right. We can't trace it back to, but if we didn't have a data set to be able and, and track all that stuff, we'd be throwing darts. And that's just, that's an uncomfortable place to be. Yeah. I think our agencies have done a lot of things really well that are, that our membership really appreciated, um, you know, starting off with, with all of a sudden revising our policies and our procedures to keep them safe when they're out on calls um, and making sure that we had the proper PPE and that we were triaging calls appropriately and only sending in, you know, the limited number of folks in there to try to minimize exposures. Um, we, we did a really good job, especially in the beginning of creating a COVID por uh, um, portal where information was being shared that could be accessed by not just by our members, but by fan members as well. And I think some of the signs that we know we did well um, we know that we did them well because they were asking for more, right? And so maybe we never got it all the way to the point that they wanted it, um, but those were those were things that that we were doing well. One of the other things that I want to point out that our our EMS is gr uh, uh, group is doing now is that they're actually creating a, a separate level of triage um, on the the call in line. And so for folks who maybe not don't need a fire response, they don't need an ambulance response. Um, they are they're doing some really innovative things uh, to get members who don't need to go to a hospital connected via telehealth uh, to to someone who can prescribe a medication or in order to get medications delivered um, in order to try to reduce the, the, the workload on our folks too. And I, I think that's something that, that uh, Austin Jurassic County EMS is taking the lead on is doing some really good work there too. So we've done some really good things. And then of course, uh, you know, we like all the departments, we're learning as we go too on what we can need more of. And, and what I hear from our folks is that uh, there can never be enough communication. Um, even if they don't listen to it or read it, uh, <laughs> they want it to be there. Um, and, and they also really appreciate it when they, when they see their leaders out there being a part of it as well, right? Um, none of us like to feel as though we're kind of out on an island doing things on our own. And I think during various, at various phases, during various things, especially with the snow storm that we had, um, some people very much felt like that was going on and that's, that's not a safe place to be. And, you, and Scott, you reminded me of something that, or to, to reminded me of something that we were accidentally successful, that we were prepared for success. Like we, we didn't, unlike a lot of places and certainly a lot of EMS agencies, we did not run into a PPE issue, you know, and, and it's not because we were able to get it. It's because we had it. And like, why did we have it? It's because our medical division is a bunch of borderline hoarders. So they had, you know, they had decent amount of N95s and gloves and stuff in, in stock, but it identified the problem with that supply stream, which is still a problem now. Everybody got used to every, every you know, medical officer or you know, EMS lieutenant in every fire department was in this, this operating mode where, well, I'll have on the shelf what I, what I need right now, because I know if I pick up the phone and call whatever my medical vendor is, the brown truck is going to show up in three days and drop off whatever I need. Well, that stopped happening. And if you didn't have it, you were in trouble. So it's, it's, and again, we, nobody can afford to, or has space to have a warehouse, but it really illustrated for us that, you know, what we needed to have on hand from a supply perspective to make sure moving forward, we didn't get in a jam because we didn't have whatever we needed. One of the other things I thought we did well, but clearly we didn't. Um, was uh, really prepare for vaccination. I thought we did a really good job of uh, an education campaign to educate our members the importance of vaccinating. And um, we're still at probably 60 or 65 percent of the department vaccinated, which means 35 percent of the department made a decision not to vaccinate. Uh, and you know, if, if any department had seen the ravages of this disease, we did. Uh, and you know, still you have 30 to 35 percent of the members making the decision not to vaccinate. So I, I don't know how we could have done a better job. I thought they were doing a better a, a good job at it. Um, I, I would love to hear from from the others to hear how with the percentage of their department. We um, and, and I'm and I'm floored by this. So, so taking the lead from a lot of other people, we we started pushing out legit information and data early on about like, look, this is this is what 
the vaccinations are. This is how they're made. This is what it is. This is what it looks like. Um, in hopes that we would have, and in, in, in Connecticut, uh, EMTs and paramedics ended up in, in phase one, tier one. So we had initial early access. Um, we ended up, we're at 91% of the fire department has been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, both doses. Um, in part because I think, it, yeah, we did a decent job of, of infor information sharing. Two, we made it as easy to get as humanly possible. Um, and, and walked people through that that effort through our medical control hospital was was really really a great partner to be able to do that. Um, I think once people started seeing that you know I didn't you know I didn't grow a, an eleventh toe and I don't have an extra nose nose sticking out of my forehead and stuff like that that helped as well. And now that we've got the entire department, not mostly the entire department vaccinated. Now we've got 40, 40 members that are working as vaccinators with the public health clinic. So now they've seen it from another direction of how thankful people are that a firefighter paramedic or firefighter EMT is putting that, you know, putting the shot in their arm and how much it means to the public. I tip the remaining section over it. It's, and, and I don't want to derail the, the politicization, politi I'm going to butcher that word. It's, it's a shame that the partisan politics sort of pay, plays a factor in, in vaccination. And then we have vaccination uncertainty in, in large swaths of the minority community that we have done in the data in Connecticut is horrendous when you look at, at white population and communities with money versus the, the very diverse communities like I serve and how that and what we need to do to, to improve vaccine equity. But it's um, for us, an organizational, and someday I'll ask why, but to, to get to 91% is, is pretty remarkable. Yeah, at, at LA County, um, it was a challenge to put all of our, you know, members through our department, not only our sworn, but our civilian, our lifeguard division, you know, you're talking 4,000 plus, it was a big uh, task to get it done. Our numbers, I think, are, you know, in the 70, 80%, somewhere in there. Um, it was a struggle, and I would agree, John. There, there's some political stuff behind it, and you know, for the most part, uh, from our side, we took a, you know, we, we just had to appreciate that everyone has an uh, a choice in doing it. Um, it got a little ugly with some people pushing, or you know, the in station, uh, you know, fighting, if you will, or taking sides on vaccinations versus non-vaccination, that actually became a real issue uh, in there, I think, with, you know, a lot of people. Uh, but once we kind of, and the other thing that I would say is that the fire department, we did all that, and then we went into that whole mode of helping the public, because there were certain cities and everything that that didn't have anything. How do you put this out and get that accomplished when you're talking about vaccinating millions upon millions of folks? Um, the one little problem that we had was that we we even pushed our folks, I think, a little too hard in that, that uh, we actually had to get a lot of people out in field in vaccination pods, and they were working day in, day out. And I think we kind of lost that sight of, uh, they need, we need a break as well. Um, but there was no other, anyone else to do it. It was the fire department had to step up and man these vaccination pods. And it really put us through a test a little bit. So it brings up an interesting question. And I know um, people, Mark just texted me, he was dropping off because we made him mad, but apparently he's back again. Uh, sorry, I know some people are having some kind of tech issues that I can't solve for you, but you brought up the, oh, and just a plug for, um, we actually have another webinar on Monday. I'll put a thing up at the end where you can send us an email. We'll send information. If anyone's interested on how departments have done a good job getting vaccinations rolled out, we've got a handful of folks that um, from departments, including Dr. Kazan, Scott from your department, um, that have done a good job. And they're gonna talk about kind of the process that they did. But, so you brought up a really good point about kind of that tension in the station what were you guys seeing or what are you seeing um, the mental stress of kind of the the taking it home the disagreeing with family the disagreeing with supervisors like this is a whole another level of um of differences of opinion that it, on like every front all at one time what did you see with that did you see firefighters struggling with it and how'd you uh how did you handle it or help people handle it or 
or what what worked what didn't I, I mean there's the level of stress without the political division is incredible and you know just simply putting a television station on a news station on is making a political statement in, in a firehouse or in an EMS station. So what, what news station is on can cause a real problem with the people that are working. Uh, and it's really difficult to manage that. We've never had to manage what station was on, you know, in, in a firehouse, they would be watching Jerry Springer or MASH or, or whatever, like nobody really cared. Um, and, you know, the, the sports game that was on, but, but now it's, you know, if you have Fox or MSNBC or CNBC, you, you're, you're making a statement. And that we, we've seen that bubble up into really to, to anger and to arguments um, and, you know, discipline with members. So that's just one simple, uh, simple issue. And, and it's, it's amazing that something that simple, a, a a relatively simple portion of the, the firehouse culture would, would create that level of friction. Um, and, and you saw an ebb and flow, you know, there was obviously, um, you know, for our community, you know, everything from dismay to, to significant tension um, in the, from the George Floyd incident forward and, and what that meant and, and what that looked like. And then, um, the, the political environment of, of, of the fall and, and even through January um, created challenges. And, and some of it, you know, I, you guys know, I've, I mean, the fire department lives and dies on its company officers. Uh, if you've got, if you've got a mope for a company officer, you're going to have a mope for a fire department. And, and some of that is, is for us to communicate down to the company officers that like, look, there's a, uh, Frank, Frank remembers Tom Brennan. And one of the best things he ever told me was there's a difference between disagreeing and being disagreeable. We can disagree all day long as, as gentlemen, but I mean, if you're disagreeable and you're, you're come to work as an, as an angry human, and it's like, all right, well, time out for a minute here. Why are you an angry human? And what are the things that we can do to, to make that better? But a lot of that we push back on the company officers is like, we, we don't always agree. I don't care if you're, you know, Grinch Green or Barney Purple, you, we all have to, to get along regardless of where you are and, and have to find a way to, to come to work. And we ended up, you know, same, same as Frank, we're disciplined people for saying stupid things about stupid things. And the behavior standard is the behavior standard. And maybe you gave people a little bit of drag because of the pandemic and because of all the other things, but it didn't, it, it can't change the standard because otherwise we, you know, we end up with some level of organizational anarchy that I don't think any of us want. Yeah, in our world too. Um, I mean, there were some disciplinary issues that were related to that, but one of the things that we saw just in our in our interactions uh, was people were posting a lot of stuff on social media, and and you know friends who are you know Facebook friends or whatever, they'd see what these other people who they worked with would post, you know, one side or the other, but uh, and, and and pick any topic that you want. Um, but but that became a real issue uh, for some people in terms of do I want to work for this company officer? Do I want to work? on the back of the fire truck with this person um, or do I need to find a different place? And so, um, so yeah, there, obviously there's always some, you know, uh, stuff that happens inside the station. But what was unique about this is that, you know, I had a lot of clients who were talking about stuff that they would have never known just from working with the person because they, they knew not to talk about it at work, but they saw what they were posting online or what they were liking online um, that, that caused some of those concerns as well. Yeah, we, uh, we, we kind of did a thing with our peers and just, you know, uh, conversations that we were having as many peers, we've got a 155 peers spread out through our department and um, we would do it in the battalions and talk to them about, you know, let the small stuff go. Don't, you know, if you can turn off the media, turn off the social media, all that stuff. I mean, um, you know, you walk into a firehouse and most of the time it's ridiculousness was on which was good you know that comedy and sense of relief i mean i don't know if i'm gonna go far back as mash um that was a good one i know what frank now watches but um you know the jerry springer stuff all that stuff it's just you know that lightheartedness in the station and we tried to influence that out in the field because we were having those issues we were having uh shift boards you know who was taking the the pv stuff serious in the station the social media um 
So we just tried to kind of gently put that out there. Let's let's tone things back a little bit. Stay away from the social media. Stay away from uh, the media on TV and certain things like that. And it seemed to help. That brings up another question. You mentioned the peers. What did you, was there anything you found successful for the peers that you do have and like helping with morale and just taking care of your people who are helping your people? Anything you'd recommend? Lessons learned there? So I, I think for us, one of the, the biggest challenges is, is for, for other, let's take COVID away for a minute, you know, in, the, in what the, the, the peer function and, and the, the peer is, is engaging with a peer who's struggling with something and that, that, that peer support team member is not having that struggle. You know, they probably weren't at that significant event or they aren't, you know, going through a divorce or they don't, aren't struggling with an elderly parent or a kid. So they, they're really well grounded and really easy to, to kind of enter that conversation to help that member back to where they, you know, back to center. But now that peer member is walking into the, to that conversation with all the same stuff stacked on top of them. You know, they, they're struggling with, now I have to be a, a teacher and I have to, you know, I have to be dressed as, you know, like a level A hazmat suit to go to an EMS run. And I've got all these other things that, so it, it made it, from my perspective, it made it harder for the peers to peer because they were struggling with all the same things that everybody else was. So, but, but I think to the, to the question, Sarah, it was just increased vigilance. I think, you know, a lot of walking around looking, um, seeing how people were doing, and, and again, the organizational support pieces, you know, the early question was, well, if I get, if I get infected at work and I test positive, I don't want to go home. And we had, you know, members with kids with, with um, medical issues and spouses with medical issues. And it's like, all right, fine, get it. Don't want to do that. We'll fix that for you. We'll provide a place for you to go. And, and you know, so we did that. And, and I think it eased a lot of stress, but it, it was just, it, it seemed like, a pretty heavy burden that, that I, that I think they're still walking around with. One of the, one of the great regrets I have um, in, in the work that we've done is after 9-11, I use peers to death, you know, like I said, we had a beach to take and there's going to be some casualties, but we, we need to do this job. Um, and, um, and, and people, you know, we, people are struggling from, from that work still today uh, because we just didn't stop and we just used our peers to, Till, you know, till they dropped. And I, I would never do that again. Um, and I think we've learned that we really do have to have boundaries and use, uh, and, and use peers sparingly, particularly in, in this incident when everybody is struggling with the same thing. Uh, you know, we're all, you know, we're all struggling, our families are struggling, our finances are struggling. So to, to use a peer that's, you know, and one thing about peers generally, they've chose the work because they are dedicated and compassionate and they won't tell you when they need to stop. As much as you train that into them, they, if you say do this, they will do it. So it's our responsibility as, as you know, peer leaders uh, to, you know, to make sure that we're taking care of the members that decide to do this work. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to brag on our department a little bit too. I think one of the one of the signs that our peer support team is really taking off is that we are getting more reach outs from company officers who are calling and texting our peer supports. They're reaching out to me to check in and let us know about someone who they think you know might be experiencing difficulties. Um, when we had folks who uh, were getting positive tests for COVID, um, our nursing staff and our physicians were getting them connected with peer support or behavioral health. Uh, folks right away from the very beginning. Um, we're doing that now for just about anything that's going to remove somebody from a fire truck, right? Whether, whether it's injured and they're IOJ and they're going to be away from their support team, whether there's any kind of disciplinary issue. Um, and so that's one of the things that, that I think um, we were heading that direction anyways. And maybe this COVID, when we look at some of the positive aspects of it, um, that, that might be one of the positives. Is that a lot of our folks from our administration all the way down to the company officers are much more focused on, on making sure we're taking care of, of people's behavioral health and at least addressing it. Yeah, Mark, I, I want to kind of just piggyback on that. I, I agree. I think it's the, the buy-in from the administration. I think this year, 2020, has forced everyone to have a true understanding of the behavioral health out there. Um, if there's any silver lining to any of this is that 
we are getting much more buy-in. Um, we are getting that from field BCs, those phone calls in. And, and to back up with the peer support team, uh, you know, there's a, a super important piece of who you pick to be on your peer support team. Mm -hmm. um, we at once had a thing where the department was like, well, no, everyone should be allowed to be a peer. And it's like, huh, whoa, no, not everybody's fit for this. And the right, it has to be, you know, you got to you got to test the waters. You got to know who you have. But because those people, and I've seen it through everything that we went through, um, the funk, you know, they were the ones to always stand up. How can I, you know, how can I help? Even going through everything they went through. On that, I would say the taxing of our peers, we have to watch that, right? We have to share the load. That's why we continue to build our peer support teams. Um, there's a need to do that. And I think... Uh, not just within our department, but across the country. I'm hearing more and more and more. Like Frank had said, you know, we want to get back to that live in-person training. Uh, Frank will have to do sidebar because I think the immediacy of getting our instructors out for these departments that are looking for peer support, it's really kind of imperative that we get going and getting departments, the, the peer support training to reach out to help their department um, I, and I would say, and this goes back to the clinicians too, that cultural competency that we can continue to build um, with clinicians around the country is so important because the burnout um, of those that we have, and we have a good group of folks that we use quite a bit, but they're exhausted. They're, you know, I, I heard a guy say, well, it's one clinician, you know, it might be two, three months before they just don't have time. Um, there's an incredible need to build not only our peer teams, but culturally competent uh, mental health around the country. Um, we really need to take a look at what the fallout of this 2020 is. And, you know, I am so appreciative of this conference call and, and or this webinar and, and just get that word out. Let's get going. Uh, we're going to need it because people need a break. Those that are in, in it, the trenches, the mental health, uh, are, are exhausted. I, I think to that, to that end, one of the other things too, that I think is illustrative and it's, it's a really difficult thing from a boss perspective to have that, to have that introspective moment. But if, if you're looking around and your organization is coming apart at the seams and it's all blown up and everybody hates everybody and you're not mission, meeting your mission deliverables and the place is an absolute train wreck, odds are it probably was headed that way before COVID anyway. So COVID might have exacerbated that and might have accelerated that, but you, you really need to take an honest look and go like, all right, what are we doing here? Because um, places that are that are falling apart were probably you know, it was, it's the Jenga pile, right? Somebody had that last stick halfway out before COVID ever showed up and COVID just kicked it out the rest of the way. Awesome. We had, um, we have two questions that I want to get to and I apologize for almost choking on my tea. <laughs> and um, then I was, of course, I'm glad we're recording this because then I started getting text messages of people mocking me for, is this your first time drinking? Sorry about that. And I was not laughing at anyone what they were saying I was laughing at the fact that I I'm glad I'm I survived is all I'm going to say um but a question what type of overlap exists between peer support members and behavioral health providers for instance do in your any of your departments do peer support members have the option to consult or have um any type of supervision with a culturally competent behavioral health provider great question I'll answer for our department and our department is yes. And so uh, we have two uh, staff psychologists uh, on contract that our peer support team can go to. Uh, we also, we've been working really hard to create additional options as well. And so uh, we're participating in the first responder mental health program that started with um, uh, providing uh, clinical opportunities for uh, law enforcement out in the community uh, where they don't have to pay for it. So there's no co-pays or anything in case there are any concerns about coming uh, within the department. And so we've piggybacked on that and made that available for our fire and EMS as well. Um, but yeah, we, we want to provide as much uh, availability as we can. And uh, the rule that we have with our folks is obviously we're held to confidentiality at a level that goes even beyond what peer support is. Um, but, but our peer support team knows that, that they don't have to say who, uh, 
just, just to let us know what the issue is and we can either try to get them connected to an outside resource or then they can come and see us when it's appropriate. That's pretty awesome. pretty similar, but with a with a a little bit of a twist is being so I've tried from a from the boss perspective to to basically, you know, the, the peer team has a, a green light to do whatever they need to do. I mean, if they need money, if they need time, if they need support, they just have to walk down the hall and, and knock on the door and go, hey, we're doing this. And and the answer is yes. So if if it's uh, you know we have our our handful of culturally competent clinicians that that we use and if they need to reach out to them and ask a question it's always yes um, the only thing you know the only thing that I ever ever see is if they have to spend money they just they tell me ahead of time but um, we've tried to be really clear from it, both with the peer team and the membership is I don't care if it's inpatient treatment. I don't care if it's a clinician. I don't care if it's telehealth. I don't care. Um, I was almost going to say we, we did have a little challenge with therapy dogs, but I mean, pretty much, you know, whatever, whatever is needed in order to get the member right, then the answer is yes. And we'll figure out how to do it or how to pay for it down, down the road. I mean, we just, we, we should be in the yes business, not the no business. Awesome. What about um, Chief Sinclair, society struggling with COVID-19 fatigue, mask use is down, civil disobedience is up, and the fire service is being coupled in some, with some, in, some in some communities with public distrust along with law enforcement. Firefighters and EMS are being attacked. Public safety is fewer people testing for open positions. How are, your, how are you handling these issues in your department? That's a big question. That is. Do we to take it? <laughs> right. And our next webinar will be just John's question. Uh, so I, you know, it's, it's, how do you, let's, let's add an extra layer. How do you in, inside the, inside the four walls, how do you provide support um, to the law enforcement entities that serve your community because you're doing calls with them every single day and, and make sure that they're valued and they're taken care of and they're supported and they know that we care um, and then be sensitive to everything else in the community. And it's, I mean, you're tap dancing on the edge of a razor blade, but I, but I think it's, you know, set in organizations, expectations, what our mission is, what we're doing. Um, the recruitment piece we've, since we're, recruiting paramedics, which, oh, by the way, we're open for recruitment. If you know any, anybody that's certified in National Registry Paramedic would like to come work in a great organization, go to our Facebook page, fill out an application. Um, it, it's, it's hard as it is. I mean, so we haven't seen, I mean, it's always a struggle for recruitment. So that's always going to be what we have seen though. And it's, it's been a thing in the Northeast is recruitment for leadership positions, particularly like chief of department. Everybody wants to be the number two guy, but chief of department, the candidate pool is a abysmal. Um, so I think it's the recognition that this stuff is hard and it's going to continue to get harder. But I, I, I think setting expectations helps with that and, and, you know, being in tune with your community, whether it's faith-based organizations or whatever the community organizations that you hire. So you can have those relationships before it bubbles up into a big deal that you, you know who to call and who to interact with. Um, so it doesn't blow up into a mess. That said, it's, it's still highly unpredictable and really, really difficult. Yeah, I don't think there's a good answer. It's, a, it's an excellent question. I don't think if there's an ideal answer for it. Um, obviously, we want to focus on physical safety to start with that. Um, and then we want to be very mindful of the fact when, when it crosses the line and emotionally it's not feeling safe, um, making sure that, that we're not having people go in situations uh, by themselves or if they extend. You know, we had some people during the snow uh, situation who weren't able to get home or they didn't have power at home, so they just stayed. Uh, we had people working five shifts in a row, which, um, and we, we broke, we broke all sorts of records in terms of the calls that we went on. Um, and so trying to take care of them. And then the thing that I encourage with all my clients individually is to take control over those things that you can control and a life that feels like it is outside of our control right now to do those self-care activities. And, and in Texas, things are opening back up again. Um, and so whether it's working out, whether it's going to restaurants, whether it's doing date nights, whether, it, you know, whatever it is, painting by numbers, learning to play the guitar, I don't care what it is. But if you can find those things that's giving you comfort, that's, that's taking care of yourself, we're trying to encourage people to really do that. 
So that brings us to what I think is a perfect final question. It's even better than mine, Mary Beth. So I'm gonna um, so I'm gonna use yours and pretend like I came up with it. Um, <laughs> Mary Beth asks. So we're hearing about what you've done for others now. Time to tell us what the impact um, has been on you and what you're doing for self care. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll jump on this and tell you that um, I, I'm not good at that, right? And I just taught a uh, I have a peer sport class in. We talk about self-care. I always worry about who's in the class that knows me because they'd call me out and go, how can you possibly talk about self-care? Um, but I will say that uh, you have to actually schedule it in. One of the things that we do in that is we kind of give a little homework assignment on one night and we see who comes back. And, and for the most part, um, through a lot of the classes that people fail just because they're busy. But actually, this one was good. We had a lot of people come back and talk about they took the time to actually pick up their guitar and play, um, do stuff that they were thinking outside the box, and they actually scheduled that in. I think it's we're getting there just by kind of absolute need for self-care. And I have actually done a couple of things to, to do that in that mindset. is like I'm going to set aside a time. Um, to do this um and it works and it doesn't you know the the mindset is that you don't have to go on vacation you don't have to schedule a couple of days or whatever it's the small little things that can unplug you for just a short amount of time um whether it's you know cooking a nice meal that's therapeutic at times when do we you know we're always in such a rush well you know just carve the time out and say you know what we're having a family meal i'm going to actually get involved with the whole cooking process it can be therapeutic um so you just have to you have to look for those opportunities and really make it part of what you do that's great scott i'm gonna piggyback on you because you, you brought up an excellent point um i have a picture of frozen yogurt uh that that's on my desk and this this comes from a client and i don't have time to share the whole story but it's an it's an example of how it doesn't have to be something big in order to be something meaningful and so this was a very, very meaningful thing uh, for that employee that day. Uh, when, when going through the worst period of their life, they had a major breakthrough and that's how they chose to celebrate it. And, and so, and I, and I told the person as they were leaving, because another client coming in and said, I don't care what you do, but you've got to celebrate this. And, that, and that's what they chose to do. And that was a meaningful thing. And that year for Christmas, I got, a, I got a framed copy of that picture because uh, I asked them to send it to me. So it doesn't have to be a huge expensive vacation. It doesn't have to be a big thing. One of the things that I do with my clients, and I also, I also have this on my desk that I grab it, you know, probably three or four times a week, um, especially with a new client. And they're, they're talking about symptoms that are consistent with depression. I said, what are you doing to take care of yourself on a regular basis? And, and, and they're dumbfounded by it because they're, they're used to taking care of other people. And so I give them the sheet on the front of it. I am write down, what are 10 things that you're regularly doing to take care of yourself? And invariably, people can't fill it up, right? And so on the back of the sheet, I am flip it over and I am start thinking about, okay, well, let's talk about five things that you used to do on a regular basis. And I had them write those things down. And then I had them talk about five things that they've wanted to do that they haven't done yet. And so they walk out of the office with a sheet of paper that becomes, becomes almost like a menu form of things that they can consider doing. And we challenge them to, to kind of prove to themselves that they're worth taking the time to do those things. And, and that's something that I encourage all people to do. And in fact, sharing your story, I was giving this lecture in front of an EMS Academy. And I thought to myself, well, what are the things I used to like to do? And I wasn't doing one of them anymore. And that night we had a happy hour and my friend's wife got drunk enough that she went home and she signed us up for a softball team, you know, and told us about it later. And this was something that we had done before kids and it was great. And, uh, and we had two people on the team when she signed us up, uh, her husband and I, but then, uh, then it provided the initiative to actually go out and do it. So it doesn't have to be a big thing, um, but to try to figure out those things that, that do work for you and to intentionally start doing them. Perfect. So I'm, I'm gonna go because I think Frank needs to go last, but so, I'll, so there's this really, really bizarre, you know, he's a senior man, so he's, he, he absolutely has to go last. So there's this really, really bizarre circumstance that, that I, I kind of came to about, you know, I don't know, 
early, you know, around the holidays, it was like from a work, you know, everybody's work life was disrupted. You know, there were parents working from home, not having to take care of kids and, and people that were working in an office weren't commuting anymore. And, and like my work, I mean, granted the, the, the amount, I mean, there's always a ton of stuff to do and there's, there was another ton of stuff to do, but I got up and, and, and went to the firehouse every day. So that is bizarro as you know, that in a COVID environment that that is, that was normal ish for me, because that was what our, my routine is just get up in the morning and, and go to the firehouse. Cause that's what we do. Um, so that was, you know, it, as maddening as the whole thing was, is having that little bit of normal structure of w- was helpful. The rest of it, I, I, I mean, you, you know, I, I suck at it. I mean, I'm just, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, I have, I have learned that um, sleep is awesome. Um, that has been the one thing is, is it stinks not to like to, to do this in the virtual environment rather than do this in the in-person environment. I'd much rather be, be sitting someplace with all of you um, and having, that human interaction because i think that's one of the things that we've missed a bunch but i've slept in my own bed for 52 weeks straight which hasn't happened in probably a decade and a half um so that that's been really really you know when you get to the point where like well i haven't been on an airplane in a year that's that's like holy cow that that never happens so there's been some good things i mean my 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 wife's niece lives across the street she's got a five-year-old son he cracks me up so i mean that 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 helps a ton but it's um yeah, I, from an, an intentionality perspective, yeah, I'm terrible at it. I'll, I'll be honest. That's why Sarah asked all of us. She knew we'd say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, keep saying yes to me, but then. Um. Always. <laughs> all right, Frank, bring us home. What well, are you doing? I, to take I, care like Scott said, and I'm like, I think pro- pro- probably everybody on this webinar, this is something that I'm really bad at. Um, I'm bad at a lot of things, but this is something I'm particularly bad at uh, is self-care. But um, <clears throat> the work is, n- is non-ending, right? It is, there's no stop to the work. So what I have learned is that I have to put a time on it. So I have to make a decision when it's going to stop for today and begin tomorrow. Um, and that's something that I hadn't done in the past. So um, it stops at a particular time. Um, for me now, like 5.30, I'm going to leave the office and I'm going to go to the gym. So I'm going to do those things, uh, which I hadn't done in the past. Another thing that I've decided to do probably about six or eight months ago is on my, my ride home is to call somebody that I hadn't spoken to in months, uh, just, you know, just on a whim, look on my phone, make a decision during the day who that person's going to be and have a conversation uh, with them. And that has been wonderful. So I, I look forward to that. Um, and they're always, you know, it's always great to speak to somebody. Some, some of the people I hadn't spoken to in 30 years. Um, and I, you know, tracked them down, a whole old college roommate, a high school friend. Uh, so I look forward to that. And, and I have a call that I'm going to make tonight. So that's been my kind of self-care. Well, I, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but I haven't gotten that phone call in the evening. <laughs> Me either, but I wasn't going to say anything. So I, just, I didn't want to dime out Frank in front of everybody. But but he does. He's got a I great point tonight. <laughs> yeah, you hope. Um, the 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 lack of human connection has been, you know, that is is pick up the phone, uh, you know, wear out my thumbs on sending text messages, going, hey, haven't seen you, thinking about you, hope everything is good. And it's it's that it's that simple. And sometimes it leads to dialogue, sometimes it doesn't. But particularly for people that in your passage, you know, have struggled with certain things, it's been a great way to kind of kind of nudge people to make sure they're doing okay. Awesome. Well, this goes kind of goes to the clinicians, if I could real quick there. So um, I believe there's a diagnosable condition we may all have, right? The COC, do, does everyone know that one? The chronic overcommitters, which I think <laughs> is there, right? Uh, or like Frank does, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, you can take pride in that, Frank, I guess, if you're you're just that good at being bad at self-care. You know, you're yeah. the first, right? He's a pro. Yeah, he's a pro. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm learning all sorts of fantastic terms on this call. So it's wonderful. Well, I uh, we are a little bit over three, but this has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much 
to the panelists who are willing to jump in and, and share, and to everyone who logged in to listen to the conversation. Hannah has emailed, so she'll um, go ahead and email out with the update of the next webinar if you want to be on that. And um, and if you have something else that you see as an issue or something you want us to talk talk about and get some folks together to discuss, we're happy to do that too. So thank you, everyone. This was awesome. Thanks. Thank have you. a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Next time, let's talk about sleep. Yeah. How about, yes. super, how about superannuation? That'd be my. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd prefer not to be that. No. Very good. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.